Welcome back to the lab. Today we're going to talk about isolation. Isolation is a very practical solution to a very serious danger. Every once in a while, and I am certainly no exception, everyone has a nice little falling out with their soldering iron. I know, I know, it isn't nice to air the dirty laundry between two people in an intimate relationship like this, but I gotta do what I gotta do, right? Well, sometimes when you've just tried everything and it's gotten nowhere, that's where it's time to cut your losses and give the silent treatment. <clears throat> If there's dangerous voltages present in a circuit, it's important that we do everything in our power to prevent those dangerous voltages from getting anywhere they shouldn't be. The concept of how, in electrical engineering, we keep dangerous voltages away from places they shouldn't be is called isolation. We're going to talk about the two fundamentally different types of isolation and two big concepts that live in this world, creepage and clearance. I'm really excited to get started with this video, but first a short word. Maybe you want to control something connected to mains, but don't know how to do it safely. We can help with that. That's what this contest is all about. Okay, that sounds great. Here's how to enter. Tell us about yourself. Tell us about your project. Tell us how we can help. Best of luck. I hope you're as excited to work with me as I am to you. So thank you for watching EE for everyone. And I cannot wait to hear about your next great project. Before we get into this discussion, there's something you should know. The probability of saying creepage when I mean clearance or clearance when I mean creepage is about 80%, give or take. They are very similar concepts and pretty similar words. And that makes it pretty easy for me to get my mix all speeched up. So I'll do my best, obviously, but if you zoom in a little bit and just listen closely enough, I'm betting that you'll be able to see the words that I want to say. Just safely look past the words coming out of my mouth. <laughs> With that off my chest, isolation. There are two fundamental types of isolation. If you grab the nearest copy of your favorite safety standard, you'll find that there are a few different types of isolation. Functional, basic, reinforced, and double, just to name a few. That said, I don't want us to get hung up on the details and lost in the specifics of these standards. I want you to understand the whole point, the big picture, if you will, of the different types of isolation, there are two main categories. There are types of isolation that are designed to prevent electrocuting people, and then there's types of isolations that are designed to make sure a circuit will be operating correctly. Isolation that prevents electrocution is meant to mitigate some serious safety hazards. But the other type's just functional isolation, or isolation that prevents high voltage from shooting across your board and popping a bunch of components off your board. The failure there doesn't result in people dying, so we don't need to have as strict of rules or requirements in this category. Isolation that's protecting human life generally requires twice as much physical separation compared to isolation that ensures correct circuit functionality. Now what that tells me is that humans are big ol' scaredy cats and that isolation designed to ensure correct circuit functionality is probably sufficient 80% of the time. I mean, getting electrocuted only sometimes while touching my phone while it's charging? That sounds okay, right? How about instead of that, we just do things right the first time instead of cutting corners, huh? To be very serious, that was a joke. Never use isolation implementations that do not follow best practice unless you're prepared to run through extensive lab testing to prove that your implementation is as good or better than the safety standard limits. If you're reading between the lines there, you may have already heard this, but just for completeness, I'll repeat it for those among us that still listen with their ears. Isolation fundamentally boils down to one thing physical separation between the two things that require electrical separation. Simple, right? There are safety standards written for a variety of applications that demand specific isolation distances or separations, and the distance required may depend on what type of product you're building. There are many different safety standards written for different applications, so make sure you're using the right one. Ultimately, when registering a device with a safety agency, it is up to that agency to ensure that the device under test is adequately safe. If achieving the separation distances listed in the safety standard is not possible due to space constraints, it is possible to run a series of high voltage tests that ensure that your design is still safe. These tests generally ensure that your device doesn't pass too much current from wherever the high voltage is to wherever the user can touch, 
and it ensures that the isolation separating those high and low voltage regions does not ever break down or arc over whenever the highest reasonable voltage is applied across it. When performing these tests, it's generally assumed that any current leaking across that isolation boundary is directly passed through the user. That's how they set their limits. Ah, right, new word, user, <laughs> just kidding. The isolation boundary is a logical line that you've drawn between the high voltage and low voltage areas of your design. This ends up turning into a physical gap or separation in your PCB layout while implementing isolation distances. I feel like we have a good handle on isolation and the concept of isolation, so let's transition into two methods of establishing or evaluating physical isolation, creepage and clearance distances. Creepage and clearance are two ways to measure how far apart something is electrically. Creepage distance is a measure of how far apart two objects are across the surface of a circuit board. This can involve current creeping around corners, around the board edge from top layer to bottom, reaching around rotted slots, like you name it, like that can go anywhere, hence the name creepage. Clearance distance is a simpler measure and it's how far apart two conductive objects are with air between them or an air gap. And that's usually just the shortest straight line distance since electricity takes the path of least resistance. There are two common scenarios where clearance applies. Clearance applies when there's a physical gap between two vertically adjacent conductive surfaces, like the lead of a component traveling horizontally above some traces on a PCB. In this case, the distance between the lead and the PCB would be the measured clearance distance. If there's a routed slot in a PCB, the shortest straight line distance across that slot ends up being the clearance distance. Clear as mud? Super! When thinking about creepage, the situation gets a little muddier. Clearance is evaluated as the shortest path along a surface, where only non-conductive portions of the PCB count. Let's run through some examples. If there are two traces, both running parallel on the same layer of a PCB, the creepage distance is measured as the shortest separation between those two traces. The smallest separation, I mean. If there is a plated mounting hole between those two traces, the creepage distance has now been reduced to the distance between one trace and that plated ring around the mounting hole, plus the distance between the second trace and that plated ring. We still need to ensure that there's sufficient distance here, because current can now leak across our isolation boundary, using that mounting hole as the weakest point in our planned isolation barrier. Typically, mounting holes would be tied to chassis ground, so that would mean they would have their own set of creepage and clearance rules defined, so let's use a better example. If we take that mounting hole that was plated for a screw, and we replace it with a non-plated hole that serves no function, what's our creepage distance now? To find out if there's any impact, let's draw the shortest path between the two traces that intersect this hole. Now let's add a line that represents the shortest path electrons can physically follow along this path while never leaving the PCB surface. We need to deviate our path as little as possible without leaving the PCB. In all cases, the electrons must now bend around this hole. So the hole has effectively increased the minimum distance electrons must follow to get from A to B. This has effectively increased the minimum path length this path is now effectively the same as having a larger creepage distance between the two traces, even if the objects are physically closer together as the crow flies. So what happens if we turn that hole into a routed slot, just kind of like an extension of the situation? Let's say we have two traces carrying mains potential and we need to get these as close together as we can, physically. Let's see if we can apply what we just learned about the non-plated hole to solve this problem by establishing adequate creepage distance with a little trickery. Looking from the center of each of those traces, the results look okay since electrons now need to bend around that routed slot to get to the other trace. But when we start to measure the minimum distance between the conductive regions of the trace, as we're approaching the edge of that routed slot, since the copper is conductive, we'll find that the creepage distance is still less than five millimeters. But we can fix this by extending the routed slot at least two and a half millimeters further than our trace on both sides. And this guarantees that the minimum creepage distance has been established. We're using this routed slot to force the electrons to creep around the routed slot to get where they're trying to go. Our trick has been pulled, but don't forget about clearance distance. 
the minimum width of that routed slot is equal to the clearance distance defined for the voltage you're working with. If the routed slot is too narrow, a spark could jump across that gap, defeating the whole isolation boundary. Thankfully, clearance distances are always smaller than creepage, so routed slots are consistently a good way to reduce, if, even if it doesn't totally eliminate, the amount of physical space required to establish isolation. This is always true because it requires more voltage to leak current through the air than it does to leak across the solder mask and silk screen on the surface of a PCB. How much better this is depends on how much moisture is in your environment. There are coatings that can be applied to improve creepage performance, but pinholes in that coating can allow the electrons to escape, defeating the whole purpose and benefit of the coating. By and large, if I can meet the isolation distance requirements for design with routed slots and voids in the copper on a PCB, that's what I'll do. I'll do it that way because it's the most bulletproof way to establish isolation and also the industry standard. If you're looking for guidance on where to find creepage requirements for your design, section 20 of UL 6730-1 provides creepage and clearance distances as they apply for circuits used in household environments. Since you're probably a hobbyist building stuff for yourself at home, UL 6730 or IEC 6730 is probably a good starting point. There are other safety standards that may provide different clearance and creepage numbers for circuits used in other applications, but without knowing exactly what you're trying to do, I can't really tell you how to specifically implement isolation that will be safe. I do know that you can probably get a copy of these standards, whatever standard applies to your system, from IEC, UL, or Intertex websites. You'll notice that I just pointed you to a safety standard in safety agencies instead of telling you to put a certain gap on the traces of your board. Well, that was on purpose since I expect that standard that I mentioned to be relevant in 70% of cases for our viewers, since you're probably designing circuits to use at home. We'll pair this standard up with some advice if you aren't comfortable determining how much creepage and clearance distance your device requires to not electrocute somebody you probably shouldn't be designing an isolation boundary for a PCB. That said, if you want to talk shop about your specific project to hammer out these details, let us know in the comments or sign up for our design sponsorship so we can help you through the process. We run design sponsorship contests uh, every now and again, like right now, where your project can get a little love from the EE for Everyone staff and community to work out these kinds of details. If you've got a project that's 90% there but needs some polish to make sure it'll be safe, it sounds like you've got exactly the type of project we'd like to sponsor when we look for projects. After all, that's what engineering school and mentorship is for, to guide people through getting a good grasp of the fundamentals that lead to engineering intuition. This intuition is ultimately what provides the ability to discern the many nuances of electrical engineering, such as what distances are required to establish appropriate isolation for an application. The amount of creepage and clearance required depends on the peak voltage applied to the board. It also depends on the nominal voltage applied to the board, what kind of environment the board will be operating in, and what kind of isolation you're trying to establish. Once the numbers are known, you can then use physical separation with the quantities dictated by the relevant safety standards and routed slots to set up our PCB for success. PCB DRCs can ultimately be set up to throw an error whenever traces are placed too close to one another flagging you to shift things around in your design until the errors are cleared. This makes it a lot easier to identify places where creepage and or clearance have been violated. Oh, oh, you wanted a specific number. Well, if you want a bulletproof distance that I'm confident will apply in practically every situation and never result in electrocution, well, I've never seen a number greater than a thousand mils in any safety standard or an inch. Ha, try to route your board now. <laughs> To make a long story short, if your system cannot, by design, ever have more than 50 volts peak in it, whether AC or DC, the safety agencies have generally accepted that there's no electrocution hazard, and you do not need to think about isolation, creepage, or clearance. This is considered a system that is operating in the self range or the safety extra low voltage range. If there's more than 50 volts applied anywhere on your board or your power supply is not isolated from voltages greater than 50 volts, you'll need to consider creepage and clearance. I hope you found this video useful. We got talking about isolation, dove in a little deeper into exactly what that means. We learned that isolation can mitigate two risks, the risk of electrocuting people and the risk of blowing up a bunch of boards.
These two situations are fundamentally very different, and that's why we typically leave twice as much distance to isolate circuits when protecting humans when compared to what we would do to protect a circuit. We also discussed some differences between how creepage and clearance distances are measured, and then we finished off our discussion by providing a couple methods of compressing a board while still operating safely and not violating any regulatory requirements. I think we certainly touched enough of these topics to leave you more confused than when we started, but hopefully you got enough out of this video to make your next circuit board just a little bit safer. All good things. Subscribe to be notified of our future videos where we'll talk about how we chose a 32-bit ARM processor to power our UPS and perform an incoming inspection, a detailed inspection of the boards we received assembled from all PCB's manufacturing line. I think that isolation is really important. If you think this video helped you to electrocute less people with your next design, let me know by hitting the like button on this video, sharing with us on Twitter, or leaving a comment letting us know what you still have questions about. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. So thank you for watching, e for everyone, and thank you for staying till the end. Bye!